John Kiley, welcome to the show. Jared, thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. It's a real privilege to talk to you, John. I've been a, a reader of your work uh, for a long, long time. I was just telling you how much I enjoy reading your prose. It's it's eclectic. It's esoteric. It's it borrows from many different fields. And I, before we even get started talking, I'm going to urge everybody listening to go and Google John Kiley. I'll put some of your references in in the show notes. Um, because it, it is really fun writing. You can actually read it and be almost entertained. So shout out John Kiley. Almost entertained. This <laughs> might be one of the most sideways but best compliments my writing has got. Uh, I guess the good thing about writing is you can go back over it and edit it. Not like a conversation. So just, I would say, manage your expectations if you don't mind. Yeah, you've got to be humble, but but it is really good. So, so John... I want you to introduce me and our listeners to who you are. What do you do? What does a normal week look like for you? What are you interested in, John? You said you're a boring guy off the air a moment ago. I'm, I'm sure you're into something interesting. So tell us what you got. Oh, sure. I kind of have to make something up now. But yeah, basically uh, what I am is, a, yeah, I've been invested in kind of sports and sports training since I was a kid. Um, had a kind of a long, mixed, varied sporting career, made all the training mistakes, all the injuries, et cetera, et cetera. Learned a lot from that kind of struggle. Um, but yeah, I was just totally obsessed with that all, you know, the, the first half of my life. Uh, I was coaching young, maybe, you know, 21, 22, uh, mostly combat sports. And then when I was about 26, you know, wasn't really going anywhere professionally. I didn't have a profession. You know, I was just working um, and and training and coaching. Uh, so a sports science degree started in the, a university, the University of Limerick. Said I'd have a go at that. Did that. Luckily enough, um, Went straight into a job within the Irish sports system, spent a couple of years there, decided uh, I don't really know what I'm doing. I need to learn more. There was a well-known professor, uh, Mike Stone, from the US who was working in the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. So, you know, saved up some money, decided I'd go do that, to do that did that, came back, worked in the Irish system. Uh, worked with some good people, you know, through uh, Sydney Olympics, um, moving into Athens, was at, at Athens with the Paralympic. Um, got a nudge about a job coming up in uh, UK athletics, which is, you know, obviously one of the, the big track and field organisations in the world. So they were looking for a lead s and interviewed for that, got that moved over there and then all of a sudden it was a different scale of challenge um working with a specified number of podium hopes for the beijing olympics and then trying to quality control and manage service to you know people who were expected to make finals people who were expected to qualify and so it was really multi-dimensional challenging interesting Long story short, stayed stayed with track and field until 2012 uh, through Beijing. Uh, then kind of old story, partner back here, us traveling over and back between Ireland and England all the time. Uh, UK University, we're starting this uh, course called a professional doctorate. So they said, well, look, we need someone who is maybe a critical thinker, but is a practitioner at heart who knows the industry. Uh, if you come work for us, you can do it from your back kitchen in rural Ireland. And that's what I did. And yeah, so I, I did that job for a few years. And since then, the I've relocated to an Irish university. Again, I say re relocated, virtually re re relocated. I'm still in my back kitchen. Uh, and... <laughs> We started a, a new professional doctorate in performance and innovation uh, there, and it is going really well. And it is, I guess, satisfying my itch to push innovation and to push 
performance and how we think about it. Uh, I guess via the medium of not doing it myself now necessarily, but working with people who are out in the field all the time. So these are, you know, the, in, in sport context, it might be people in La Liga, EPL, NFL, all kinds of everything. So it's, you know, I, I am harvesting the benefits of the technology, you know, that we can have. Like we're having a conversation now. You're sitting in Australia at one end of the day. I'm here in the other end of the day. Later on, I'll talk to people in the US, in Europe. Uh, so, so yeah, so it's, it's great. I'm I'm like a child in a sweet shop, basically. All from all from your kitchen in 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 Ireland, John. It's a uh, it's a fairly surreal thought, really. If you were to to take this conversation back fifty years ago, twenty five years ago, and imagine that your primary occupation was was doing this with with athletes and coaches and and what have you all around the world, it, it wouldn't really make much sense, would it? No, and. It's amazing the uh, the kind of density of the experience and interactions you can have now. It's just unbelievable. I mean, mm. you know, when I kind of came out from my primary degree and I was working in the field, it was pre Sydney. It was ninety eight, and this was like a, I, I don't even know if Skype was a thing then. Um, and now it's it's, it's yeah it's, it really is good and it's just talking to interesting people every day in all kind of far flung corners of the world and yeah I love it. It's it. I have an anecdote about Sydney Olympics in two thousand, John. I I won a competition. I I'm, I've got an athletics background myself, and I won a competition to go to the Sydney Olympics in two thousand and watch a couple of obscure events. It might have been like handball and something else obscure for, for for people down under and so ba- there was no skype because i remember having to go to a payphone and i didn't know how to use a payphone i was like 12 years old or something and to ring my parents to tell them that i was okay i don't know why there wasn't a landline they should have provided that for us but but there you go there was certainly no skype and i had to set up an email address specifically for that trip um so there you go mate so there was definitely no skype back then well, what I'd say is to, you know, to any kind of young practitioners coming through now, the opportunities there are just to interact and learn with people. It, yeah, it is unbelievable. And when I, I really didn't want to work in a university, I wanted to stay in professional sport. That was my meat and drink. But it was just circumstances. And I wanted to definitely keep a foot in the, in the larger sporting pool that, that is the UK. So it was um, it was a best fit rather than something I thought. No, I I really like this. Um, yeah. But yeah, but but it's worked out well. Now and every now and again, I do, you know, I I get to go to professional out, output or outfits and you know do a talk or run, run a workshop, and that keeps me happy. And every now and again, I get a decent contract that might be you know four weeks away or six weeks away for some tournament, and uh, and that kind of satisfies that itch as well. There, there is an, an inexorable pull towards academia that I'm starting to see as once you get to a certain level. So it's good that you're enjoying that and also you get to uh, get your feet wet every now and then with some field work. So that's that's good to see. Yeah, well, I, I still feel that that's my home turf, mm-hmm. you know, but as regards that inexorable pull towards academia, I guess it, it's probably not towards academia and, and and I know that's not necessarily what you meant, but it's it's towards higher level critical thinking. And I guess in in sp- certainly in professional sport, it didn't really evolve. It just kind of happened, mm-hmm. and it was driven by a load of what I think of now as kind of archaic beliefs, beliefs and ideas. And I think the more people spend thinking about it, the more they're seeing these big gaping holes in our philosophies, and the more they're thinking. I could do something about that. I could change that. I could I could move this forward in some way. I could innovate in in this space in some form. So the people that that, that I'm kind of lucky enough to work with now, yeah, they're they're all trying to they're fill gaps, drive innovations, and it's just amazing to see 
how many there are really lots of things that I've never thought about. Uh, so, for example, I've worked with people who are interested in communications. Brett Bartholomew, um, who many of your, your list, listeners will know, folks who are in maybe EPL context who are interested in decision making. So sciences that exist in other domains, but you know, even though, for example, we swim in the water communications as physios or sports scientists or coaches, but no one ever educates us in communication. Decision making, the same thing. There is ways to make better decisions. There is ways to design meeting processes, data collection processes to optimize, inform decision making. But again, it's not stuff we ever learn in our conventional uh, professional courses or CPD opportunities. So yeah, basically, as you can tell, I'm a I'm a pig in uh, I'm a pig in shit, basically. <laughs> The best type of pig. All right, John. So you, you, <laughs> there you, go. you, you mentioned uh, gaping holes before. So let's explore some of these gaping holes. That's that's a horrible turn of phrase. I apologize for that. So let's explore. This. Let's, Sorry, I'm trying to I'm trying to scrub it from my yeah brain at the moment. Uh, knowledge gaps. That's a little bit more politically correct. So I first came across uh, your work. Probably a few years ago now, reading this this paper, one of your landmark papers in sports medicine, probably, where you you challenge, maybe attempt to refute, maybe that's too strong a word, but certainly challenge periodization and the theory of periodization. That was a really interesting read, um, and this is this is this concept about general adaptation syndrome, or you in the paper you talk about general adapta adaptation syndrome which was proposed by Hans Selyer. And then you sort of talk through about how this general adaptation syndrome has now evolved into this concept, which we call allostasis. And it just hasn't been a natural evolution. That's sort of where we are today. So physios are becoming much, much more aware of general adaptation syndrome, allostasis, all of these kinds of terms. Do you mind just giving us a little bit of historical background to what these terms actually mean. Perfect. Um, so I guess like most practitioners, I bumped into these terms through the periodization literature. And I guess I've come to view the periodization literature um, a little skeptically as time's gone by. I, I know I've been, I've been thinking about this since at least 2000. I mean, I started writing about this in 2000. I, no, it nothing happened with that writing. It was just me, you know, scribbling. Um, uh, but it eventually turned into a, a, a paper I wrote in 2012 when I was, I was still a practitioner uh, that did get published. But uh, long story short, if you read a periodization paper, periodization is essentially, if you boil it down to its kind of bare bones, it's about prediction. As coaches, uh, as rehabbers, as physios, we we want, to, we want to know how we can give people best advice. We want to know how we can plan for somebody. Periodization is essentially the science of saying, well, this is what we know. This is the theoretical background. So we can predict what will happen. So, you know, we will plan what you're going to do for the next four weeks. Then we're going to change. We're going to do something else for another four weeks and so on. And obviously that's where the word comes from. You're breaking everything down into periods. Now, the justification for that, uh, like the big, I guess, uh, I, I don't want to say lie. That's probably too strong. But the first missing step there is it's pretty clear. It is blatantly clear at the moment that you cannot predict training outcomes or intervention outcomes. You, you can't. It's been you know demonstrated multiple times empirically. How it's still to this day, and there was a paper in 2018 in sports medicine, which is you know top tier uh, sports journal, and the title was you know general adaptation syndrome. Uh, and yeah, it was all about how the general adaptation syndrome is the foundational bedrock upon which we build our, our certainly our periodization. So what is general adaptation syndrome? So this was Selye 
experimented with rats in the 20s and 30s. Uh, and using the very coarse metric of, you know, sacrifice the rats. First of all, he would stress the rats in some way, put them on the roof in Canada when it's really cold, put them in the boiler room, chase them around, all these type of what we would think of now as stresses, sacrifice the rats, uh, ground up their adrenal glands and weigh them. You know, that was, it was, it was pretty basic stuff. But he came up with this concept of the general adaptation syndrome, which basically says when you get a stress and a key characteristic of a stress, so some stressor is applied to you, there is a sequence of steps that happen. There is an alarm step, a resistance step, and then if you keep stressing yourself, there's an exhaustion step. And he graphed this. Now, Celia late in life in you know maybe 82 or so was interviewed by um maybe he wasn't interviewed but certainly he did a presentation in relation to sport i think maybe in australia and he is quoted as saying uh, he's ne he never thought of his his um he only thought of things in the medical context he never he never thought to apply them to sport but within sport we've taken those ideas and and really ran with them to the extent that they're still ingrained in sporting culture. But if you go and look at other scientific disciplines, GAS is is a it's a dead notion. It is it is not a thing. There is no general adaptation syndrome. We're still redeploying it in sporting contexts. And again, from my perspective, it's a setup. It's a way of justifying, well, no, this is predictable. And every periodization paper you'll see, go and have a look. There'll be this a mention of Selye. They'll probably mention Walter Cannon, who came before him, who coined the phrase homeostasis. It'll probably mention Charles Bernard, who came before them. 80, you know, the late 19th century, early 20th century, they'll show the graph and then it will be quick sleight of hand that goes from this all about prediction to and now so here's how we lay out training mm. and there's a veneer of um what i would think of as really archaic citations that go underneath that something to justify time scale and it's normally some archaic russian or soviet reference that you can't find or when you look it up it's about you know, something that is completely not re directly relevant to sport. So there's something around timing. There's something around order, where order is we do this type of training first and then we do this type of training. Again, built on these shifting sands of, well, first we'll have the general science justification, then we'll have this very light touch of uh, selected evidence to substantiate uh, timing, or to substantiate order. And, and, and I guess this is what I was seeing. I, I don't know if this is built on anything and then becoming more and more clear that this is a this is a magic trick, essentially. We're going back into the past, we're picking up some evidence that really suits our purpose, and then we're um we're building a story on top of that. Mm -hmm. Now, just to clarify, I I I'm not pointing my finger at anyone. What I'm saying is we culturally, that's what we've done. And that's been our way of, I guess, coping with the uncertainty of, oh, I do not know what to do with this person in front of me. How am I going to manage this uncertainty? So that was a long roundabout answer. Just one thing to go back to gas. Uh, it's pretty clear now from the science, the only time there is anything like a gas response is in extreme stressors, like, you know, major burns, septic shock, you know, this type of thing. There isn't any gas for... So gas meaning um, general adaptation syndrome for everyone? Yep. E yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm. again, and this is Celia's uh, formulation of... This is what happens. This is the graph. This is the chart. This is the way, you know, if you get a stress, this is what happens. And then the sleight of hand was fitting a time period to that. And the next sleight of hand was 
okay, well, first you do this and then you do this. And here's some justification, albeit very vague. It's a very handy justification and something that a coach facing all this uncertainty, fumbling around the dark, can grab onto and go, okay, now I know what to do. And it, in a way, it's you can't blame coaches because it was here's something to grasp onto in the wilderness mm -hmm. um, where there was no other messages really there was no other uh, theory of how you should construct physical exercise in a coherent intelligent way to get you the, the optimal results that you wanted one other point I'm, I think I briefly mentioned um Walter Cannon and homeostasis. Homeostasis is the notion that every process in our body is kind of tightly bound within constrained limits. And once there's some form of perturbation, whatever that may be, there's some form of perturbation that knocks that homeostasis, homeostasis outside of those limits, then that's what instigates a gas response. And the gas response is there to restore that homeostatic balance. So to bring it back into bandwidth. Now, this is my long drawn out way of kind of pivoting into allostasis. So the way to think of homeostasis is uh, there is a specified bandwidth for all these different processes in your body. Once they go outside that bandwidth, there's an alarm response, activates a gas response. The gas response restores homeostasis to within those tightly bound limits. So, and, and that was, I guess, common belief, I don't know, maybe 60s, definitely getting challenged in the 60s, definitely being overturned in the 70s, but certainly since, you know, 2000s. It's clear that, yes, homeostasis is a thing, but it's only a thing in some very critical processes, brain pH, things like that. It's not a... It's not a, a way, it's not an efficient way of regulating all neurobiological processes. It's just those really critical ones. So a way to think of it is there are some critical processes that if they go, if they de if they're deviated through perturbation outside of their tightly bound limits, they're going to cause a negative cascade of consequences that can be fatal. But they're very much in a minority. So the literature at the moment would suggest that homeostatic processes are in the minority. Instead, what we have is um, a much more flexible system that and that you mentioned as allostasis. Now, terminology can be thorny here because there's, is it allostasis? This other group over here says, no, it's adaptive homeostasis. You know, so, so there's some terminology, ter terminological thing going on. But what I would say is, Conventionally, our belief was homeostasis is disrupted, boom, gas response, predictable. Now it is, okay, yeah, there is a homeostatic processes, but they're very much in the minority and they're, they're critical life-threatening issues. Under that, all the other processes, ultimately, they're allostatic processes, meaning that they vary widely, in tandem with each other, in concert, in collaboration. They're not tightly bound within limits. So maybe I should pause there and take a breath and, and just see if, if uh, yeah, if I've gone too far off track. No, it's a fabulous, fabulous start. So general adaptation syndrome is this linear, predictable, repeatable, kind of process when there's a perturbation to homeostasis to, to bring us back to, to homeostasis effectively. And this was this, and this was proposed by, so yeah, a long time ago, originally with rodents. And then we've extrapolated this um, in, in a very creative way, um, <laughs> judging on, on the history there. And it ended up being a real bedrock and foundational principle in sports science and training, which is interesting. So much of what I agree, I what you said there, I can really relate to, John. And what I'll do in this episode 
is I'm going to relate a lot of what you say in coaching and sports science to physiotherapy and, and pain and injury, because that's my area of expertise. And you mentioned uncertainty because coaches have to latch on to a principle. <laughs> Otherwise, what are you doing, right? It's all haphazard. Same thing in physiotherapy. We have to latch on to certain principles and those principles may not be the most accurate, but Hey, it's a working hypothesis and let's just run with it and see what happens. And, and to be honest, some of these principles kind of work, right? They're not, they're not abject failures by, by any respect. Someone might get a good response with a periodized training program, but the mechanisms underpinning that might be different for each person. And we can talk about that a little bit later on. So this concept of uncertainty, we latch onto it. It's a coherent hypothesis. It's a, it's a coherent principle that we can understand. Makes sense. So we latch onto it. There's so much parallels with physiotherapy there that, you know, we're sort of breaking out of the biomedical model, which I know you've got an interest in too, particularly the biopsychosocial model, John, which we, we can maybe even go next. We've had to break out of it in physiotherapy where we've got this reductionist look at the world, your pain is due to this structure. Your pain is due to this muscle imbalance. Your 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 dysfunction is due to an underactive middle, lower trapezius, whatever it might be. We're trying to break away from that really granular and overly analytical kind of clinical reasoning. Can you can you relate that? Does that sort of is that a is that a decent analogy to draw from a physiotherapy perspective back to your coaching and sports science perspective no absolutely and i think in coaching and sports science we're we're behind you folks in terms of overthrowing the biomedical model we are very much biomedically driven just to pick up on a couple of other things you said there i i totally agree i mean this it's this isn't about periodization is wrong it's about sometimes Periodization templates can really help you, but it depends on context. If you're working with, I don't know, 150 university level athletes and you're one person with limited brain space and time, yeah, you're, you're going to have to take some shortcuts. Uh, it's when I say shortcuts, cognitive shortcuts in terms of how am I going to organize this? Well, I can't organize, I can't individualize for everyone. So I need to organize it like this. And something like periodization provides a template. So it can be useful for sure. But we shouldn't um, conflate that utility with being accurate or being based on scientific principles because it's neither. But once we acknowledge, okay, I'm going to make some big, bold assumptions here and it's not going to be perfect, then that's fine. Mm. I guess where I get a little bit irritated is when we try to smuggle those convenient principles in under the kind of banner of oh well this is scientific or if you don't agree then you're disrespecting the work of these great scientists who went before where well, you're not you're, you're trying to build on, on top of what they've done aren't you you're trying to improve one thing that i i will also mention is that if you were to boil it down to, you know, and you could go down the rabbit holes of homeostasis and allostasis, and both are essential, you know, in, in effect, there are different words for different ways the body reacts. If it's a homeostatic reaction, then it's a severe challenge. If it's an allostatic reaction, then it's probably just mundane, everyday training challenges, for example. But both of those work together. You know, if allostasis goes wrong, homeostasis has to kick in and correct it. Oh, a, a good way of thinking about this is homeostasis is reactive. Homeostasis kicks in if allostatic, all allostatic processes have continually got it wrong and now you have a drama on your hands. Mm -hmm. Now a critical process is after going out of whack or something happens that was totally unpredictable. So with an allostatic process, the way allostasis works is it is anticipatory. It predicts your brain, predicts what's going to happen and starts to adapt in advance to meet that future challenge. And I guess that's probably the biggest step change. It is the idea that 
in professional sports, uh, I think in, in rehab RTP as well, we have this still embedded belief that if I want someone to adapt, something to adapt, the stimulus I need is some physical stimulus. An allostatic perspective would say, well, this is all anticipatory. If I am stressed, for example, you mentioned the word stress earlier, if I am stressed, what is that doing to my adaptive processes? Well, in effect, stress is some sense of threat, some sense of upcoming uncertainty. What does your brain and body do in those circumstances? Well, it starts to more tightly regulate resources, where resources are cognitive attention, uh, kind of big expensive molecules you use in the brain, energy, all those things it conserves. What does that do for adaptation? Well, it limits it. You use an extreme example just to kind of prove the point, or not prove the point, but drive the point home. You put a, a growing kid in a high stress environment and their growth will often slow. Why is that? Well, it doesn't make sense to keep adding on, spending resources on these building projects if you're not sure about whether you're going to survive tomorrow. So everything goes into maintaining, when I say everything, cognitive resources, um, chemical, neuro neurobiological resources, energetic resources, everything goes into conserving a current state of high alert. It does not, it is not dedicated to building projects. So with things like psychogenic dwarfism, which is you know extremely rare, but it's where there's extreme stress and your body just stops linear growth, stops neural development. That's an extreme case of, I think, what happens with stress. If you're stressed, illness takes longer. Pain, in most contexts, will go up uh, or will be higher. Um, neural development goes down. Learning goes down. So all these negative things that are really just reflected facets of the fact that your brain and body are carefully regulating expenditure in case they need resources right now to save your life. So can I just check if, if that made sense or if I went off on a little bit of a journey there? Really good. I, I want to take that in and now apply it to sport or to athletic training or to coaching or, or whatever you want to do. So how do these principles or how should these principles underpin our approach to exercise prescription if you're a strength and conditioning coach or a PT or whatever you are, if you want to, let's say, obtain some form of outcome. Now, everyone's going to have different goals. So let's let's just start really, really broad. So how do we apply these principles of more of an allostatic type of thinking, a non-linear, a chaos theory, a complexity theory kind of thinking, and apply that to exercise prescription, for example. Brilliant. Thank you. That's a really kind of focusing question that let me clarify some things. So what we normally do is the coach or the therapist or whoever goes away and in their brain comes up with the best set of exercises or the best program. But what the fact that so much of our regulation is anticipatory, it is your brain making a prediction on what's going to happen next, what the challenges you're facing. And off the back of that prediction, mixed with prior learning, is deciding how much resources can be afforded to be allocated to uh, responding to that exercise, let's say. So there is, we've always believed, driven by the biomedical model, that the stimulus for adaptation is the direction and magnitude of the physical stimulus. What contemporary theory suggests, allostatic theory, you know, predictive processing theory, uh, which is the premier replacement of the biomedical model in, in current science. What that suggests is it's not just the stimulus, it's your set of beliefs, assumptions, biases, aversions, preferences, anxieties that are wrapped around that stimulus. So it's not a case of you apply a physical stimulus, 
and maybe you're stressed and that takes the edge off your adaptation. It is the initial stimulus is a combination of what you do physically and your set of beliefs and assumptions around the implications of that stimulus to you. So the implications would be, can I handle this? Is this something that I'm nervous about? Am I anxious about this? Is this an injury risk? Does this make me feel uncomfortable? I really like this type of training. I really believe that this type of training benefits me. It's all of those things. Now, if you were to drill down, uh, and I, I like this is a, a wormhole, but my reading of the, the kind of current best science in this is that fundamentally what drives stress, anxiety, or dampens it is uncertainty. Uncertainty about what your future, your immediate future holds for you. If you can provide certainty, then you dampen down stress, for example, you know, anxiety. Uh, if there's a lot of uncertainty, then it does not make sense. Your brain is going to budget resources accordingly. And it's going to be, look, I'm not sure if this is safe. I am going to hold back here. Now, I'm, I'm using the term hold back. Hold back is chemical resources, energetic resources. It is likely all kinds of bioelectrical resources as well that we're, you know, we don't really have a good handle on. But if we just take that as a general principle, and it kind of it's nearly common sense, there's a budgeting problem our brain faces all the time. Is this safe? Is it not safe? How can I make it safer? If I'm anxious about it, how do I resolve anxiety? And based on those trade-offs and negotiations, your brain is allocating or not allocating resources. And that is what fuels performance, movement, adaptation to physical stimuli. How did that go? Did that did that land or was it very unclear? Sound, sound very good. I I will I will attempt to add a couple of things if you don't mind, uh John. Perfect. And again, relate to to physiotherapy or uh, musculoskeletal healthcare. So couple of things that you said really hit home again. There is not a one-to-one -one or an isomorphic response between stimulus and outcome or result. Basically we, we, we see that with training, which you're alluding to, and we see the exact same thing in, in pain with, with nociception or a one centimeter cut is not half as painful as a two centimeter cut. Pain, pain goes beyond the size and the magnitude of, of the injury that you may have. You know, there's this, there's something emergent there. There's not a one-to-one -one relationship between tissue damage and the experience of pain. And you're kind of saying a similar thing with, with responses to, to training stimuli as well. I think, is that, is that correct, John, before, before I go any further? There? Yes, I'm saying the exact same thing. It is not, it is not, obviously, it's not a nociceptive signal. Yeah. Wrapped around that are all type of, yeah, it's, as you know, as pain is a perception. It is not a direct translation. Of Depends a, who you talk to, John. There's, there's a, there's a, there is a conversation out there between sensation versus perception, which I'm trying to get off the ground in terms of a debate, but I'm with you. I believe pain is a perception. Well, yeah, well, okay, but, sorry, this is a wormhole. What, what am I do if you think you and your listeners would be interested? I'll send you on what I think of as the kind of major paper in, in, in this area for theoretical background. Uh, and just really briefly, it's by three kind of really heavy hitters. Um, Akin Peters, who back in the late 90s came up with the selfish brain hypothesis. Bruce McCune, who is one of the key academic drivers of allostatic theory and Carol Friston. And for any other kind of nerds out there, Carol Friston is like this deity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, especially when you come into, you know, uh, predictive processing, predictive coding, active inference and so on. Um, I don't so interrupt I, you I for too that. long, John. I just want to say Carl Friston, I looked up his H index the other day, 280, his H index. He has like, yeah. he gets like 500,000 citations per year. 
It's um, yeah, I th- he's he'll win a Nobel Prize one day. No, for sure. I think um, but very very, it is. I think unless you're totally invested in that field, it is impenetrable to us, if you like. But there still is messages coming from that, and maybe. There's maybe two things, if it's okay to have a slight pivot just to kind of bring us maybe back into the practical world. If I was to kind of think of what was the big difference between older perceptions of homeostasis and current perceptions of, yeah, okay, of course there's some homeostasis in emergencies, but it works hand in hand with allostasis. And allostasis' function is to prevent homeostatic reactions effectively to preempt challenges and adapt in advance to meet those challenges. Homeostasis, as perceived in the exercise literature, is an archaic interpretation of what Selye described. And that was a brainless phenomenon. It didn't care what you thought. It was, you know, it, it happened like from the head down. If You, you know, it was a glandular, automated, reflexive Brilliant. reaction. Yeah, but it was automated and reflexive. Allostasis and contemporary theories are firmly putting the, you know, the origin of the stimulus that drives adaptation to exercise and our injury and our pain. It's a brain-centered phenomenon. They are brain-centered phenomenon. And it is, they influence emotions, perceptions, cognitions, and actions. And through those kind of four avenues, that's a response. It's not like, well, there's a physical response. It's not to do with the brain. That is not the case. Now, quickly translating that to kind of to, to, to more deal with the world of uh, pain, injury, adaptation. What you feel, what you believe is, is a fundamental part of that adaptive stimulus. It is not just a physical signal. It is the physical signal in conjunction with your set of beliefs of what this physical ch- challenge means and your perceptions of the resources you have or the capacity you have to safely handle that challenge. Love it. Love it. So let's apply it now. So how how would we apply this? Say, say John, you're handling a group of athletes. They are college level athletes let's say they're in the usa for whatever reason because that's neutral between you and i and they are basketball players and they've got dreams of going to the nba and they've got they've been given this they've all been given this three athletes have been given the same program by their athletic trainer or whatever they are over there and it's meant to to achieve similar outcomes for all. They're meant to make them strong. It's meant to make them powerful. It's meant to make them jump high and it's meant to do something else. So how, how, why is that wrong first and foremost? And why, if indeed it is wrong from your perspective and why, why might we want to, to, to take an alternative approach and instead of assuming a one size fits all approach is adequate. Okay. Um, so first of all, I wouldn't say it's wrong. I think ultimately we need to put things down on paper. Do, you know, we need to communicate with athletes. This is what you need to do, or this is what we're going to do. And I think, I think that how we do that should depend on context. If I'm working with 150 athletes, I'm going to have to make generalizations. I'm not going to be able to go around and talk to everyone and educate everyone on, you know, why this is good. This intervention is really going to help you. I can't do that. So I have to make generalizations. Um, And in a sense, that is what the basis of periodization is. It is let's make these generalizations based on the science available at the time. But the next step was let's scale this out to everybody. Then, you know, it's like whether you're an elite triple jumper or you're part of a squad, or you're in a kind of some aerobic group that need to lose some weight, it's the same type of principles, whereas it's not. It depends on resources. If I have time with you, 
then we're going to go into things in more depth. We're going to be more sensitive in terms of how we retune and recalibrate training. But just to go back to your question, it's large scale. Okay, how can I take these principles? Well, first thing we need to do is, is there any way, for, and these are just examples, is there any way I can kind of survey the beliefs of these people? Um, so maybe there is, maybe there's a time efficient way, and maybe it's three questions that everyone gets on the squad, they get an email, and you get that information, you think, okay, well, look, maybe there's some education needed. How can I educate 150 people at the same time? Uh, okay, well, maybe I can, I'm, I'm not going to sit them down in a class, but maybe at the start of every session, I'll give them a two-minute brief. And every two-minute brief, I'll reinforce some messages. I'll reiterate, here's why we're doing what we're doing today. And maybe there'll be a sentence or two to kind of nudge their understanding forward. And in a very simple way like that, you can start to foster understanding, deeper understanding of training processes, deeper understanding of um, what they need to do or the life that they need to lead. And maybe, so I guess the other step I would always have then is some feedback mechanism. And again, that feedback mechanism would need to be scaled to actual context. You know, I'm, I'm not going to have 150 sit downs with people, but maybe I'm going to give them a 90 second debrief at the end of the session. And I'm going to ask, mm. OK, I want three suggestions of, uh, you know, things that aren't working for you or you feel are getting in the way or something like that. So I, I guess I'm kind of tying myself in a knot here, but there's always some way within your context, regardless of what that context is, that you can gradually start to move understanding, belief, buy-in further down the line. There's always some way that you can uh, get feedback. There's also always some way that you can impress upon the people you're working with that you have their best interests in heart and that you were taking a professional and thought through and considered approach to their care. And if you were getting those messages across, that is that is powerful because that is, that is, it, it's not just a nice to do, but in terms of if I go back to what's the fundamental stimulus, the fundamental stimulus is not the physical um, exertion. It's not your just your belief around that exertion. It's a mix of those two that will regulate the magnitude and direction of the adaptive response launched in response to the, the exercise challenge. And just maybe to clarify a little bit, I, I came across lo lots of this through looking at the placebo literature. And within medical contexts, there is that move now towards well, rather than just driving an intervention, let's maybe survey whether patients believe this intervention will be helpful or not. And if there's a, if if the feedback comes back that well, no, they don't really think it's helpful, then we have a problem. But I think that that penny is dropping. That these beliefs are really important, so we need to adapt our processes around that. And I know in the physio world, you know, there's some kind of standout folks that are pushing this message, uh, certainly down your neck of the woods, Larimer Mosley, uh, Peter, Peter Sullivan, you know, di different people like that. Uh, so it's becoming much more common and noticeable in your uh, domain. In professional sports, not really there so much. Very, very erratic. And again, it's it just seems we're on that transition point between all that old biomedical reasoning and a more, and again, it, there's a terminology thinking, it's the, here, here is it biopsychosocial or is it more of a predictive processing driven phenomenon? But we have that conflict. And uh, I guess we need to think about it in terms of exercise prescription as well. Exercise prescription can't just be numbers on a page that the coach pulls from their brain. 
it has to be something that is it comes to life it is it, it through communication, through designing processes where athletes feel that, that their opinion is valued, where they become more invested in the program, they buy into the program, they buy into you as a coach, they understand you have their best interests in heart. You take care of your communication. Last thing, and I know this is a really big rant, so sorry. Um, one of the issues that's come out of the placebo research the past few years is the disproportionately damaging effects of nocebos. Um, so it's not a one-to-one, -one, you know, here's a unit of placebo and here's its minus one nocebo effect. As human beings, we're kind of evolutionary wired to be sensitive to risk, to be risk averse. So a little dollop of nocebo can undo a lot of positive placebo. And and again, I'm sorry if this is getting confusing. <laughs> to me, placebo, it's not a it's not a thing. It it's a reflected facet of predictive processing. Placebo is just I get a positive message, or I get some hint that the future is going to be brighter, and that changes my resource allocation determination. So now, hey. Things aren't going to be so bad. I can free up resources. I don't have to stay on this highly alert, highly sensitive state that costs a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Nocebo, the opposite. Okay, whoa. Okay, I need to dial back here. I need to husband or carefully manage resources because I need to maintain a highly alert state that's really, really expensive. So we need to be careful in nocebos, nocebo signals. We need to promote placebo signals. And the final layer then is we need to do all that in an, in an ethical, non-deceptive way. <laughs> so we're yeah. gone way over time. I'm sure you dropped off there. No, oh, no, I'm, I'm hanging off every word, John. Really good. I, <laughs> I've got a lot to say. I mean, I, I wanted to interject 25,000 times and, and say something, but uh, <laughs> I had to I had to utilize some self-control. So really, really good. But um, where do I go here? So placebo, nocebo, fortunately, fairly well researched and people are, are aware of it in physiotherapy. So well done for you to you for bringing this to the coaching realm because i mean still still in physio i say i say we're aware of it i mean that we're in an echo chamber i guess so so i think everybody's aware but you go out into the into the to the messy reality and and and, and most people aren't unfortunately and and throw away no cbic comments are being thrown around all the time which undo all the good you've just done in the 29 minutes prior unfortunately and I just thought so something else I want to talk about while I've just, I'm just going to switch gears just randomly right now, because I just had some weird thought pop into my head. I don't know how that happens. I don't know the process of thinking, but something's just come into my head. And when you're saying that you, you basically alluded to a moment ago that in, in not so many or not the exact words, but I'm going to paraphrase you a little bit that, an individual will probably have a different response to a stimulus based on that, the entirety of what being that individual means from a genetic perspective, from an epigenetic perspective, from a socio-cultural perspective, from a physiological, so on and so forth, right? There's probably going to be some spectrum of response to the same program. And I'm reminded of, of these twin studies, which have been done um, here in Australia where identical and non-identical twins were exposed to uh, a, st a strength training program and a and a and I think a, an aerobic uh, program, and even identical and non-identical twins have a different response to this stimulus. And I'm sure you're aware of this, John. And it makes me think: if identical twins who are theoretically genetically the same have a different response to the same stimulus of course there's going to be a different response between you and I or or me and someone who's living in South Africa or, or somewhere else in the world. Do you have any comments or commentary on that? So, so yes, I guess one of the big 
debates, obviously, is nature versus nurture. And that, that study, that Australian Marsh 2021 study, uh, showed that identical twins were having as much difference between responses as non-identical fraternal twins and, and randomers. Um, and it's really interesting uh, that like one of the reasons for that is potentially, well, okay, well, what were your beliefs around that or what were your perceptions? What were your the set of cognitions, emotions wrapped around that particular training? Because that's that's a regulator of resource allocation. And so yeah, so that Mars study was powerful because it kind of pulled the rug out from under the, you know, any remaining thoughts that it's dictated by genetics. Mm. It's not, obviously. Um, <laughs> so, but it, I think that there's some things we don't know. You know, there's a lot of th there's a lot of kind of biological, neurobiological adaptation we haven't figured out. But at the same time, we know enough to know that the way we've done it in the past isn't the right way. And we need to adapt accordingly until more evidence comes up to, you know, not just even in a, in a more a well-directed um, direction. Sorry, I'm getting mixed up my words. I did see something that I, and I'm sorry, I don't have the reference to hand, but I'll find it for you and send it to you. But just yesterday, I was reading another recent study that came out. Can't remember who the first authors were. And it was relating response and non-response, I think, to medical intervention, some in medical intervention on pain. And what they were coming back with was the differentiator, the differentiator or key differentiator was perception, or sorry, I'm saying perception, set of beliefs. Whether you ex your expectations, did you expect relief did you not expect relief and that was pretty much dictating response now yeah. that's very rough and i'll need to refresh my memory but again that logic maybe speaks to my biases in terms of okay well that would make sense to me we have some work here that that i know i know the author very well rachel chester she's published a paper that suggests expectations of physiotherapy so whether you expect a good result or a bad result and there's a there's five points in between if you expected positive results with physiotherapy you got better if you expected poor results or were agnostic about your outcomes with physiotherapy then you had a statistically worse result and the and the other one was self-efficacy so your which is effectively your, your belief in your ability to to manage your shoulder pain and so expectations and self-efficacy were the biggest predictors or um what mediated outcomes more than any other variable. And they included like, I think baseline pain and disability and, and various other sort of biomechanical or biomedical kind of measures. It was expectation and self-efficacy, which is fascinating. Well, that I, I guess that chimes with what, what we've talked about. I guess we're just extending it to, adaptation how you regulate the resources necessary to productively adapt to an exercise stimulus that's pretty much budgeted by how you feel about the value of that stimulus and its potential contribution to achieving your long-term objectives mm. so so yeah that may that might well be the study i'm actually talking about i'm, I'm, I'm not sure We've got a ton of them. We, we know in pain that the, the, the biggest predictors of outcomes are non-physical, basically. It's, it's all what's going on. It's the, it's the inner movie, which is driving the outcomes in our mind and more than anything else. And we're, we're, we're pretty onto that. Some of us are pretty onto that in physiotherapy. And I'm, I'm so stoked that you're flying the flag um, when it comes to, to coaching as well, because I believe it has, it has, the potential to have such a great effect on outcomes for everyday coaches in my opinion do, do you do you see that this would have a positive effect for the the day-to-day -day handling of, of clients in a gym if you're a personal trainer or do you feel like this is too metaphysical do you feel like this is too philosophical and it won't it, it won't impact their day-to-day -day exercise prescription no, I definitely don't feel that. I feel this is a necessary evolutionary step. It's like, 
good exercise prescription isn't writing down sets and reps and exercises and then giving technical instruction. That's not it. It's John, are you saying that exercise ex- prescription goes beyond sets and reps? Uh, yes, I definitely am. And, and, and you know, take technical considerations. And that's the way I was educated. That's the way um, a lot of coaches operate. It's like, that's what gets the brain space. That's what the coaching conferences and workshops are about. Exercise design. And don't get me wrong, I'm the biggest offender in the world. I've, you know, nerded out that for donkey's years. But it's more than that. It is... And, and you kind of summarized it well in the, in the last bit you talked about. It. And I, I was thinking, that's just the whole podcast in 30 seconds. It is exercise adaptation or, you know, or any experience, any perception we have. It's not, it's not mechanically driven. It is a product of your expectations married with reality. And then your interpretation of that reality and how it relates to you, your long-term goals, whether it's a risk, whether it's a, something positive and, and productive. Um, now, there was something else I was going to say. So, yes, so co- that's what coaching is. That's what physio is. I think it is in the large part, in a sense, you are the placebo or the nocebo. The way you carry yourself, the way you present, the way you communicate the kind of vibes that you give off in terms of how you care or how you don't care. Um, and I think it opens up the extent of the challenge as well. If if we are carrying that in our backs, that oh, does it, if, if I make a mistake and drive a nocebo response, that's a big no-no. It, it's a pressure, but at the same time, for me, that's the job. You just need to be carefully considered just to, in the exact same sense as you'd expect an athlete to warm up and get their head in the game as practitioners, then we need to do that too. I, I've, I've just finished some research and submitted a paper where it's basically a qualitative study where we're interviewing people about their experience with exercise. And you could have given the best exercise program under the sun, perfectly prescribed based on what have you. But if you if that person hates you, doesn't trust you, doesn't care about anything that you're saying, then that exercise program is going to fail. So this exercise program has a causal power only if it's manifest in the right way. So it's dispositional only if it's met with a patient who can actually manifest that positive result. So this this there's no one best exercise program that you can just parachute into some sort of physio office and it's going to help everyone. It's always complicated and interdependent on the particular patient in front of you, your relationship with them and the, and the specifics of the exercise program. Any commentary with that? No, I totally agree. Absolutely. And I think it does put more of a challenge on the practitioner, but again, that that's the game. If you're in the game, you, you gotta, you know, you, you, you gotta acknowledge that and adapt to to kind of meet those demands so the, the last thing maybe or one of the last things i say is that i think really good coaches certainly in my world if you go back far enough in any of the major sports the really legendary coaches had this they might have been able to describe it using you know the terms that we use but they were good at managing the person in front of them they were good at communicating now I don't think it means that, you know, good coaches and good um, managers, good communicators come in all shapes and sizes. It's not about, you know, for me, you know, normal, average, boring white male. It's not like me trying to be a comedian and get everyone on board with me. It's it's not that at all. It's just me uh, communicating in a way that is authentic for me, essentially. And so the athlete who is motivated or the person in pain who is re- desperate to get out of that pain, they they invest, they, they, they believe, they see that I'm on board and I'm behind them and I'm on their team and I'm guiding them as best I possibly can. That's what's important. It's not so much you're kind of all singing, all dancing, trying to get a personality transplant. You know, we are who we are, I guess. It's just been the, 
and I don't like using this term, but like being the best possible version, it's a performance. You see a client, you're 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 on stage essentially. Absolutely. Yep. You gotta be I say a clinical chameleon. You've got to you gotta you gotta perform, you gotta adapt, you gotta you gotta you gotta be this person and the next person. It's fatiguing. It is hard and I I burn out a fair bit actually when I'm seeing a lot of patients, but but just but it's the way it's gotta be. Um, John, I'm conscious of your time. We got to question two out of the eight questions that I had written down. Um, but we covered a lot of ground. So I don't think we've missed anything. Is there anything else that you want to teach me or the audience or at least converse about? Oh, I, I'm, I'm definitely not a teacher. I'm more having the conversation with people person. Um, yeah. Let me see. Uh, no, I, I think the concept of, I mean, conventional perspective, historical perspectives, biomedical model, it's brainless. Contemporary scientific perspectives and how we manage, it's all about, uh, it's, it's brain centered. It is the brain is the organ of stress. The, you know, the, 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 it is the brain that runs the budget. And that budget is very, very influential. Uh, so if we want someone to allocate resources, valuable, precious, limited resources to things like adaptation or managing pain, then we need to give them good reasons to do so. You know, so yeah, I guess that's a, a kind of a, a pivoted into a little bit of a summary there. Yeah. Good, good. We've been from from cellier and, and rodents and gas to allostasis to to everywhere in between it's been a, it's been a really good conversation um i want to ask you though john uh I, this is a customary finishing question or a traditional finishing question i know you're a reader so what what book are you reading if or what books are you reading because i know you're an avid reader and and i want to know what tv show you're watching and it and I don't care what it is. You've got to be honest. You've got to you've got to be upfront about what TV show you're watching as well. Okay, I guess uh, books, uh, fiction. I'm reading Frederick Backman. If people have heard of him, um, a man called Ove, I think might have been his first one. So his latest one is called The Winners. It's um, set in Scandinavia, ice hockey town. As somebody who struggles to write a lot. He's just a fantastic writer. For me, you know, sparse, clean, really succinct. So I, I really like him. Uh, and that's a really good series of books I'm enjoying. So so that's fiction. Nonfiction, uh, I've kind of two on the go at the moment. One is uh, called Active Inference, which is the densest, worst nighttime reading you could possibly imagine. Um. And Carl Friston, who we mentioned, is a co-author on that. And it's his first venture into, um, I guess, uh, non-peer-reviewed writing. But yeah, it's, it's it ain't easy. <laughs> uh, and then I'm reading a book called Immune, which is basically about the immune system, uh, which I, I know it sounds very dry and very boring, but I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Love so, it. Uh, Love so yeah. Can, do you recommend the Active Inference book by Friston and colleagues? Um, I think you, you'd have to know some of that, like ha have read around it first. What I'll do, if it's okay, is I'll send you the uh, Peters, McCune and Friston paper. I think that's a much better introduction and that boils it down much more succinctly within a paper. The, this book, I, I can't judge in it because there's so much stuff that you have to go away and research and it's probably going to take me seven years or 10 years to read. So. Yeah, uh, it's not riveting. It's not a page turner. Yeah, cool. And what what about TV show? Let's go there. Okay, I'm going to be very dry and boring here. And uh, every now and again, my my partner forces me to sit down and uh, not go to the shed and do a bit of exercise and watch something. So uh, the last thing we were watching, Succession, Succession maybe. Yeah, so, so cool. yeah. Cool. That's an all right show. That's so, got... That's got seems to be critically acclaimed, so it's not too bad, John. No, 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 it's good. Um, she 
yeah, I'm not a great TV person. Um, yeah. Good. But I, I but, but I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> I, I realize I'm I'm not just boring, but antisocial and boring. So. Well, I disagree. I've had a I've had a really great time talking to you, and I'm sure listeners are going to get a lot out of it. A lot out of it. John, I want to thank you for your time. Jared, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I'm sure we ran over time. Sorry about that. And yeah, it was, I enjoyed the conversation. So thank you. John, thank you very much.